All right, oh, now, now's the time for the kids to come forward. <clears throat> Sorry. Kids, you can come forward at this time. That would be great. Oh, it, it's been a long week. I know. Come on up. It's been such a long week. I don't have much of a voice left, so come on in, guys. Come on in and have a seat. You have to forgive me. So, Eric, you may need to boost my signal. Just, uh, just, I'm so thirsty. What, what, do you, what do you need to do when you're thirsty? Someone raise your hand. What do you need to do when you're thirsty? Get it? There's a bottle over there. Can you grab that for me? That metal one, go grab that for me. Oh, I'm so thirsty. I just, I need a drink. It's right under the seat. See it's silver? Right there. Can you grab it? Okay, good. Alright, let's, <clears throat> let, let's give this a try. Let, let, let's give this a try. Donna, you ready? Uh, uh, let's give it a try. Camden, I think there's a Packers water bottle under there. Can you try that? <laughs> that just didn't work at all. I'm still so thirsty. Let, let, let's try this one. Don, are you ready? All right, let's do it. That, that just didn't seem to work. Drew, I think there's one other bottle right over there. Can you grab that for me, buddy? Oh, this this one. Oh, it's a Camelback. It must be good. Let, let's try it one more time. Go ahead, Don. None of these seem to work. Does anyone know why? Raise your hand, Edward. Why? Oh, Camden and Edward are right. They're absolutely empty. So I thought for sure that these water bottles at least had something to bring some quenching to my thirst, but they're, they're all completely empty. So, so what do I need to quench my thirst? If I'm really thirsty, what do I need? What do I need? Water. Water. Ooh. Maybe this, Don, can we see it? This is fancy water. Don, can we see a picture? There we go. Let me try. Life water. Purified, pH balance, electrolytes for taste. I feel much better now. But I'm still kind of thirsty. But what we're going to talk about today is that the psalmist thirsts after God. He's so thirsty, his soul thirsts after God. And what we're going to see is that we can try to do other things but a lot of times it's just empty. And, and we can even use gimmicks like this really expensive, fancy, schmancy water. And they may make us feel better for a little bit. But the only thing that's going to truly quench our thirst in our soul is the worship of the Lord. Good job listening, guys. Thanks for helping me out with those water bottles. Ms. Jamie, would you hand out a M&M's? All right. I want you guys grab those. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head the rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you can open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 63 today. Good job. Thank you for helping me out there. If you're a guest with us today or watching at home, we are in the middle of our fall sermon series called Worshipper. And we're in part two today talking about worshiping the Lord with all our soul. Don, if we could go to the next slide, that's the series slide. Using clips from the 2016 movie, Hillsong, Let Hope Rise, each week we're looking at a different aspect of what it means to be a worshiper. Last week we looked at worshiping the Lord with all of our heart, and today we're, we're looking at worshiping the Lord with all of our soul. And so I want to look just briefly at the theme verse. Can we see it? Last week we dug into Mark 12, 30, where Jesus commands us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Again, last week we talked about worshiping the Lord with all your heart. If you missed that, it is on YouTube. And today we focus on worshiping the Lord with all of our soul, or what's known as our self-conscious life. Next slide, please, Don. The Greek word Jesus uses for soul 
refers to the vital energy which animates the body and, and shows itself in breathing or living being with personhood. And so one song that mentions worshiping the Lord with our soul is a very popular song. We sung actually a few minutes ago. It's called Oceans. All right, so this is the first time Don is driving back there. So Don, what you're going to do is go to the OSB and you're going to transfer, right? You're going to transition over for the folks at home. And so let's watch this week's video. My soul based in you. Like, not to sound like, because it's not about me. What? Be honest. What's been the feedback for your performance on Oceans? Yeah. Um, people said thank you. Some people thank me. I don't know, it sounds weird, but for the high note, because they're like, it's that, it's that moment when I, I get emotional. Just, you know this. Um, yeah, people just said thank you, because it's like, maybe that moment for them is like, the moment where they just don't know, like words to cry out to God, or like, like words to explain a situation, and like just kind of like unlocks things. Some people have said that it's like giving expression to something that I didn't know that I could say to God, or like have that moment of like, this is so hard, yet I trust you, and yeah. So that's the main thing people have said. So. So again, as Taya pointed out, that one of the aspects of worshiping the Lord with our soul is that sometimes we don't even have the words to speak. And so when we looked at the theme verse of last week, Jesus was quoting the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if we're going to understand what Jesus meant by soul, we need to go to the source and look at the Old Testament word for soul. Can we go to that slide? Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I just said as we ought to understand what worship all of our soul, we need to understand the word soul found in the original Hebrew is this word called nephesh, which refers to our inner being, if a person, of a person created in the image of God. Today we're going to look at a psalm written by David, which refers to our soul four times. There's another slide. For there we will see that our soul is the part of us that has the ability to process thought, have feelings and emotions and make decisions. Some who've spent a lot of time studying the soul would say that it's made up of our mind, will, and emotions. The reality is your soul is your real you. And so keep that in mind as we look at today's passage. It will be up on the screen. Where we see it's a psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My soul, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. For I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. For those who want to destroy my soul, will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. And all who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. And so when we think about what it means to worship the Lord with our soul, as Taya pointed out in that video clip, sometimes we don't have the words to speak. Sometimes we're in such a difficult season of our life, we just don't even know how to pray. And so the Psalms, as we talked about for many years here at Red Arrow, give us the words to sing when we don't know what to say. 
And so in this particular psalm, we see the scribe do a little prescript that points out that this was written by David. Yes, that David, the David and Goliath, the greatest king over God's people, when he was in the desert or the wilderness of Judah. Now, we know from other scripture passages, this could be of any number of times where David was on the run. He was on the run for his very life, and he would go out and have to escape the enemies who were chasing him to a desert, to a wilderness, where there wasn't much food, there wasn't much shelter, and there certainly wasn't enough water. And throughout the centuries, this idea of a wilderness time not only conveys literal wilderness, where you're out and you're exposed and you're in danger, but often more of an emotional, a spiritual wilderness. Maybe you're going through a difficult time. Maybe you've just had a surgery and the recovery is more difficult than you feel. Maybe you're fighting cancer and you're not sure how many more days the Lord has for you on this earth. That would be considered a wilderness time. And so it's in those times that we see the words of David resonate with our soul. And so if you were upset, if you were running for your life, if you were in a wilderness time, wouldn't you start to gripe about it? Wouldn't you start to complain? Wouldn't you say, God, I can't believe you're putting me through this. But notice David, the psalmist, starts with the source of of the person who could lead him through this wilderness time. He says, you, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where you earnestly want something, that you diligently follow after something, that you have a goal, and you do everything you can to strive for it. That is what David is doing towards the Lord. And then he describes, I thirst for you. How many of you remember running a marathon, perhaps, or playing doubles practices in football? A time in your life where you were thirsty. Raise your hand if you've ever had a time in your life where you're thirsty. Some of you, apparently not, but that's okay. We all remember a time, at least we all know that there was a time where we were thirsty. And so David describes this spiritually desert wilderness time saying that I thirst for you. In fact, my soul, my whole soul, whole being longs for you. And the only way that he could describe how this soul is longing and earnestly looking towards the Lord is just like a physical thirst in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Now, if you were thirsty in the ancient world, and so we've seen sort of in cartoons and movies, when you're in a desert, what are you looking for? An oasis. And so sometimes you're in the desert, and you're so thirsty, and you look and you say, oh, it's an oasis. No, it's a mirage, right? And we've seen in television shows and survival things where people go a little bit crazy, and maybe they'll try to drink sand because they're so thirsty. Or if we were maybe in more modern times, we'd go for one of those way stations or the National Park Service where they have those pumping wells. Aren't those fun? Right? Where you're just like, I'm so thirsty! And you just got to keep pumping and pumping about finally the water. And you're like, oh, it's so wonderful. And normally it doesn't taste very good. But you don't care because you're th so thirsty. But in our modern times, if you were working out, maybe playing golf, maybe you'd go to the nearest gas station where they have a Gatorade right there already chilled just for you. But for David, when his thirst is so deep and so significant that he goes to request to quench that thirst at the sanctuary of God. Verse 2, I've seen you, Lord, in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because not only was David physically thirsty, not only was he running for his life, which caused him to be spiritually thirsty, but he is actually far away from the presence of God because at this time, the presence of God dwelt among the Ark of the Covenant, which was found in the tabernacle and later the temple. So he was actually not only far away from safety, he was far away from the presence of God. But he remembers that in the sanctuary when he was worshiping the Lord, he was reminded of this vision of power and glory. And because of that, he could say, because your love is better than life. Now that's a tremendous statement. If you're dying of thirst and you're running for your life, would we have the courage to say, Lord, your love? And that is that Hebrew word we've talked about many times, hesed, which means the steadfast love of God. So everybody take a deep breath. That is an example of the steadfast love of God. The Lord takes care of his creation. We're given breath to breathe and water to drink. And it's because of the steadfast love of God, it's better than his actual life. 
And because of that, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I am. And in your name, I will lift my hands. And so sometimes as we're singing in worship, some people might lift their hands. David is remembering what it was like to worship in the presence of God. And even though he was far away and he felt like the Lord was so distant, he's still going to have communion. He's still going to praise and he says, my soul will be satisfied with the richest of foods. Now, how many of you like to go out to eat? All right, hands down. How many of you like to go out to eat at fancy restaurants? Right? And, and of course, your parents try to take you and you're like, shit, it's a nice restaurant. Right? Don't do that. Right? I remember telling my kids that this is really expensive. You have to behave. Right? But how many of you have ever been to a really fancy, expensive restaurant, and you have the meal, and as you're walking out of the restaurant towards your car, you're still hungry. <laughs> yeah, right? It wasn't like you went to any soul food restaurant. No. You expected to walk away feeling, oh, that was so good, and you look at the receipt and said, why am I still hungry? The portions were so tiny. <laughs> David said, no, 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 no. When we go to worship the Lord, we are satisfied as if eating that soul food, that richest of foods that fully satisfies. And he says, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Now, I'm not trying to be critical of other churches that don't feel safe singing, but I can't imagine coming to worship with all of you and not being able to sing. I don't think David could either. But not only that, he says, on my bed, I remember you. Now, how many of you like camping? All right. How many of you struggle to fall asleep when you're camping? Exactly, right? Oh, there's a root right on my back. Or, oh, I'm on a rock. Or somebody snoring. I'm looking at you, Dean. And so you, you, you're trying to fall asleep, and you got all these strange noises, and you struggle, right? How many of you have ever struggled with insomnia? No, I have. And so here David, out in the middle of nowhere, sleeping under the stars, running for his life, spiritually thirsty, and yet amazingly, on his bed, he remembers the Lord. It gives him a sense of peace and rest, and he says, I think of you through the watches of the night. He's able to get a good night's sleep because he knows even though he's far away from the presence of the Lord, he's running for his life, he's spiritually thirsty, that the Lord is going to protect him. Because you are my help, he declares. I sing in the shadow of your wings. He's protected. And then he says, my soul clings to you. Think about that for a minute. Think of a little child who's scared. What do they need? A hug. Right? I had a, a great privilege of teaching just kindergartners and young fives right now. All day long. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Anna, can I get an amen? Right? I love my kindergartners. He's not over there. One of my students was over there a minute ago. And so sometimes, you better believe when I go to greet them on the day, they have this look of panic on their eyes. But all we have to do as teachers and as parents is say, it's, it's going to be okay. And you better believe some of those kids cling to me as we get them to their class and get them situated. That's the image we see that for David, because he knows who God is, that his very soul clings to you, Lord. Your right hand upholds me. And you think, well, well, what about all of these enemies who are literally trying to kill him? Even though he's still under attack, even though he hasn't seen the victory, prophetically, in faith, he declares that those who want to destroy my soul will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths. They will be given to the sword and become food for jackals. And I know this is a little bit graphic for our modern ears, but you have to keep in mind that anyone that stands against the Lord and his anointed are going to face the same fate. David understood that. And even though he had not fully experienced God's justice, he knew that it would come. And because he is the king, he is the anointed one, he declares in faith, the king will rejoice in God, and all who swear by God will glory in him with the mouths of liar silence. So any one of us, no matter where we are on that spiritual journey, whether we are incredibly satisfied or we're feeling spiritually thirsty, anyone that declares the name of the Lord is going to end up on the right side of redemptive history. 
And so think back to the children's illustration down. Let's see if the slides are working. There it is. How many of you have ever had this life water before? Eh. It's really expensive, though. Um, we'll get to why it's expensive in just a little bit. But as I was preparing for today, I was reminded of the experience of a person actually living in a desert, in a wilderness like David. And I was reminded of the rule of threes. In survival literature, they tell you that you can survive three minutes without breathable air. You can survive three hours in a harsh environment. You can survive three days without drinkable water. And you can survive three weeks without food. And so I want to zero in on that water again. Next slide, please. And I went to the website, and, and I purchased this, and I said, well, this is going to take away all of my worries, and this is going to make me feel so satisfied. I'm like, wow, that was really expensive, and I really don't feel any different. And so this, this is where they charge you so much money. Welcome to a new premium bottled water experience, fusing creativity and design to serve as a source of inspiration and hydration. Life water is purified water, pH balanced, and with electrolytes added for taste. Refresh your mind, restore your body with a daily dose of inspiration. Don't you want to go out and buy it right now? <laughs> hey, life water people, if you're watching, uh, I could do a commercial for you as well. <laughs> and you're like, why is it so much money if it's just water? Well, it's, if you'll notice, on the bottle are different artists. Have you ever heard the expression, starving artists? So what they do is they have different artists design the bottles to inspire people. So as you drink the water, you're looking at the art. Wow. <laughs> oh, I feel inspired today. That's a gimmick. <laughs> Come on. You think about these empty water bottles. They didn't satisfy. Why? Because they were empty. And yet it drives me nuts today. How many people feel spiritually thirsty and they, oh, is, is, that was right on cue. <laughs> Will Billings, <laughs> so take this in the water. He's thirsty. What does he do? Do you have life water? What kind of water did you get? Um, no, mine was less than 1.00 cents. <laughs> <laughs> He's a math teacher. He knows how much to take water. That's awesome. No tax. No tax. <laughs> Crazy. That was the, but here's the thing. People are looking for satisfaction to fill the hole in their soul, and so they, they try gimmicks like life water. And sure, it may help them to feel better for a little bit, but in the end, they just feel empty because it doesn't truly satisfy. I, I think I have another slide there. Huh? Very good. Why is it? Why is it that it doesn't satisfy? Well, the body cannot live without water. It's lack quicker than anything else except breath itself, is felt in desperate desire. The soul cannot survive without God. That is true of every human soul, not just the deeply pious. Many or most may not understand the thirst that disturbs and drives their living, but it is there because God created the human soul to correspond to God. Where that correspondence is weakened, Disturbed or interrupted, the experience of its lack becomes like the thirst and hunger that is the opposite of being satisfied. The advantage of the psalmist, and I would argue the advantage of every single person in this room, is that we know what is missing. We understand that the dissatisfaction of life is the thirst for God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for creating in us this thirst, not just for physical water, but more importantly, that our soul thirsts for you. We long to be in your presence. And Lord, we know that we're not there yet. We know that we're still on this journey. You give us an oasis each and every Sunday to come together and corporately worship you. But as we talked about last week, you don't have to just sing and play music to worship. We can worship you as we are caring for children. We can worship you as we're working in a factory. We can worship you as we're making chicken nuggets at McDonald's, Lord. We can do all things because worship is a disposition of the heart, and now we've learned the soul. So, Lord, if there's someone watching right now, 
If there's someone here in this worship space that longs to be fed and quenched by you, Lord, may your spirit pour into them like a mighty rushing river. And so, Lord, help us that when we have friends and co-workers and family members that, that are just like, you know what, I, I've tried this gimmick and I've tried this religion and, and I'm just left wanting and, and I'm left being still unsatisfied and thirsty. Lord, help us to point them to you, the only source for the thirst of our soul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.